You're listening to P-R-O-X. So when I applied to Cal for the film yeah. program, I didn't write about it in my essay in applying to the school, but I just noted it. And yeah. I just said, hey, I've been incarcerated. Just want to let you know, FYI. Yeah. And from that point forward, I'm convinced to this day that's why I got in because my GPA was horrific. <laughs> it, was, it was like 1.3 when I had to like petition to get back into Howard because I yeah. was on academic probation just to finish Howard. Yeah. And then when I applied to Berkeley, I think it was with a 2.6 GPA, but I got in and, yeah. and I felt that there was something about the act of me acknowledging, you know, who I was and the fact that you could see F's, F's, F's. <laughs> D, C's. And then when I came back to Howard, it was like straight A's. Yeah, just the art. Like, and the story. Yeah. And that from that point forward, I felt compelled to be open about my story. And I felt compelled to want to understand my own story. You're listening to In Proximity. Today, we have a very special conversation between two colleagues at Proximity Media. Co-founder and head of nonfiction, Pete Nix, and creative executive D'Angelo D'Lo Lewis. Pete is a director and producer whose award-winning films, The Waiting Room, The Force, and Homeroom, serve as a trilogy of urgent and immersive documentaries that explore healthcare, criminal justice, and education in Oakland, California. His upcoming documentaries produced with Proximity Media include Stephen Curry, Underrated, and Anthem. D'Lo got his start as an assistant on Space Jam A New Legacy Judas and the Black Messiah, and Black Panther, Wakanda Forever. Most recently, he was an associate producer on Creed 3, and he works with our music division on our soundtracks. Outside of Prox, Dilo is also a writer, director, producer, and music manager. Pete and Dilo met through their friend and Proximity founder, Ryan Kugler, and they connected as creatives with roots in the Bay Area and the shared experience of incarceration. Pete spent a year in federal prison and has made films about doing time and about his drug addiction. Dilo served an eight-year prison sentence before working in the entertainment industry. On this episode, Pete and Dilo sit down to talk about their experiences for the first time, including how they found their way to creative work and why it's important for them to share their stories. I'm Pete Nix, and I'm a producer and director, and I also run the nonfiction division at Proximity Media. My name's D'Angelo D'Lo Lewis. I'm a creative exec at Proximity Media from the Bay Area, from Richmond, California. Born in Akron, grew up outside of Boston, came of age in Washington, D.C. at Howard University, and then moved out west came for film west. school. Then many stops. Been many stops. Yeah. I guess, well, we started where, how we first met. Our friend, Ryan Kugler, and colleague at Proximity Media, he actually, um, he spoke about you a lot prior to us actually meeting. Just talk about our similar experience, you know, back in the day. I don't know when you guys started talking about right. this. I first heard about you, I'm trying to think, because he's, he, he would tell me that he had a friend who was doing some time and that he was corresponding with him and he was recording the calls, he was having this sort of ongoing conversation. Oh, so, so you heard about me while I was gone? Okay. Yes. Oh, okay. Huh. And I'm trying to remember when that was. It must have been, because um, we met in 2012 when my film, The Waiting Room, came out. He was making mm-hmm. Fruitvale Station. And at some point along the line, he told me about you. I feel like it was when he was making Creed that he first mm-hmm. told me about you. Yeah, it was a while ago. I'm just thinking about, I was doing time according to his movies, meaning like, I remember where I was at when he, Fruitvale dropped. I remember where I was at when I first heard him. He was saying, I'm just making this little boxing movie. <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay. Little um, movie. <laughs> need some money on my books. <laughs> All right. But yeah. Um, and I think I told him, I think I told him about my, I had made a documentary. My first documentary was about the impact that my addiction and incarceration had on my family. It was sort of looking at more of a middle class, upper middle class black family, mm-hmm. uh, which things like that aren't talked about openly. Yeah, There's a lot of shame around things like addiction, alcoholism. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to, I had made a documentary about exploring the impact that that had on my family, but I I felt like more needed to be said. So I was trying to adapt that documentary into a fiction piece. And I think that's when Ryan told me Uh, about you. That's interesting. But go back a little bit. How did you guys 
know each other in the first place? Like, what was your connection? And Coop, um, we met each other, I say, he was about seven, I was about eight. We we're playing for the Berkeley Cougars, um, Pop Warner football team. I was a quarterback, he was a running back. Um, it just happened naturally, like just organically. We, like, if I'm the quarterback, I'm the quote unquote leader. And so I had to know all the plays and I had to know where everybody was at. And usually, you know, as kids, we're eight years old. Nobody remembers the damn plays. Mm. Um, I used to have to, every time we broke from the huddle, it'd be like, all right, bro, you got to go over here. You got to go over here. And Ryan actually, like, I didn't really have to tell him anything. He was one of the sharpest cats on the team. And I had other cousins and relatives that played on there and they were pretty sharp as well. But me and him just kind of just developed this relationship of um, quarterback, running back. Mm -hmm. And I started going over his house, you know, just to play video games and whatever. And um, the crazy part, he used to give me a pair of shoes every time I left. Like, because I didn't really, my mom wasn't giving me Jordans or nothing like that. But um, I remember he used to bless me with a pair of shoes every time I went, over, almost every time I went over his house. And the thing is, my mom, she used to try to make me go to church on Sundays. And she was like, uh, you can do whatever you want to do if you just go to church with me. I was like, I want to go over Ryan's house. And that's how I started. We actually just kept in touch. As we got older. After that Pop after Warner. After Pop Warner, yeah. Mm -hmm. We just stayed in touch. Because, I mean, sports was always the thing that kind of, like, brought us together. We always played sports, but we never played on the same team again after that. You were living in Oakland at the no, time? or I was in Richmond. Richmond. He, he had moved from Oakland to Richmond. Um, mm -hmm. His parents had a house in Richmond. And as we went our separate ways, meaning, like, he went to this a certain high school and I went to a different high school, um, we just stayed in touch. Even when we started going to parties, his pops used to come pick me up and, like, That'll be my party partner. <laughs> we, me, it'd be right. me and him um, battling against the whole party. <laughs> um, but it's just, you know, stayed the same throughout high school. And when he ended up going off to school, I was outside. To, to college? Yeah, yeah. He was mm -hmm. going to college. I was outside doing everything not right. Were you guys <laughs> already, uh, I mean, were you already, whatever, getting in trouble, so to speak? I, I was. What, what was the thing that started sending you... Down my, my path, um, I mean, I think it starts with everybody or from around my way, like the lack of funds, resources, whatever you want to call it. Um, I remember distinctively that my mom was like, I'm not giving Michael Jordan no more of my money. And I said, he's going to get all of mine. <laughs> and ever since then, I've been on one. <laughs> I remember getting a job at, I think I was 14, and you have to be 15 to get a worker's permit. I lied on my application. So I can get a job and get these pair of Jordans that was coming up. And two weeks into working, the dude pulled me to the side. He was like, hey, bro, all your stuff came back. He like, you're not 15. And I was like, and I just stared. I, I didn't want to admit it or say nothing. He was like, man, I got to right. let you go. But they paid me my check and that's all I needed. Right. <laughs> so I was good. But that's kind of like where everything started. When you're trying to figure it out on your own, it's no real limits of what you'll do. But it's like a, like a hustle, like yeah, a, like a, like like, a goal, setting goals or, or having an idea or a vision for what you wanted your life I think he's subconsciously setting a goal, but no, it's not even that big yet. It's not even a sense where, oh, I want a better life. No, I just want these shoes right now. That's it. That's all that matters. Mm -hmm. Nothing else. And um, I don't think you let nothing get in between of that. As you grow and you start seeing what you don't have or what, what people other people do have, I think that's when it starts setting in like, okay, my mom works, she works, but he stands outside. You start putting things in perspective of like what people do to create the life that they have. Mm. And it gets pretty tough because you start, that frustration starts to set in. Like, am I destined for that? How am I going to deal with this? Because I want a nice house. I want a nice car. But why does, why, why does he have it, but he's not going to work every day? And you start questioning those things. And once I start figuring that out, it was more like, okay, I know what I'm willing to do and I know what I'm not willing to do. You, you were locked up. You did one stretch? Or, or well, I've, I've been I've been to jail when I was younger, like younger here and there, short stints. But this was my longest stint, like that um, eight year stretch. Yeah, yeah, because I, I I failed in 2011, uh, and didn't get out till 2018. So you did that one big stretch. When were you locked up? What was going on in your life? Where did you go? So this one big stretch that happened from 2011 to 2018, 19. Uh, I was living in L.A. at the time, and I ended up catching my case in L.A. So I had to go through L.A. County, did like a year in L.A. County. And once you get sentenced, you have to go upstate, which is state penitentiary. Um, I want to say two different, like you have state penitentiaries and then you have federal penitentiaries. I believe you were in federal penitentiary, right? Yeah. I believe I was 23 years old. I remember it was March 16th. <laughs> 
March 16th, 2019, I had signed for 10 years. They were trying to give me like 20 years, but we all took a deal, which allowed two of us to get 10 years. One of us got four years, and then I believe another one got 16 months or something mm. like that. We got me and my one of my closest partners, we got the longest stretch. And um, I remember, I actually remember signing for my time. And when you say signing for your time, what signing, does that mean? Basically signing your deal, agreeing that you take this 10 years for this crime that you so called right. committed. Sometimes you're not even admitting guilt. It was like, nah, you just gonna sign this and say, you know, to get this time up out of you. But um, we had to admit guilt. Basically, they asked us in court in front of everybody to say what we were guilty of. Right. Um, I remember they got upset with me because I was like, man, y'all already know what we did. <laughs> Why you gotta be sitting here repeating this? And I actually, uh, they, I thought they were gonna sit me back like the bullpen with all the other cats and everybody talking, chopping it up. They put me in a cell by myself, and I just remember. All I could think about was what I was doing 10 years ago. And all that time from then, all up until now, if I would have missed all that. Mm. And that was where my mind was at. And um, as I went on my journey, I stopped at several different prisons. We, I actually got sent out of state to Arizona as well, because it was like an overcrowding situation in the California prisons. Yeah, um, They were sending cats to Mississippi, Oklahoma, Arizona, all over the country. And um, I bounced around and I actually ended up towards the end of my sentence at fire camp. And then I actually went to like this halfway house where I was able to like, so I gradually got reacclimated into like being outside because yeah. fire camp held me like your level one at your federal level penitentiary one federal, had yeah. no gates. Uh, same thing with fire camp. You can just walk straight off. Right. Like, if it's a road right there, you can ask somebody to pick you up and go. Yeah. Um, I had a few friends that walked off, but you can never Go back to fire camp, you get to escape, and you'll never be able to be outside. They're going to ship you. They're gonna, yeah, 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 100%. So yeah. Um, got there to fire camp, and then when I got to the halfway house, we had to wear an ankle monitor for like 90 days before I uh, came We don't have to do the monitor. Yeah. I, I was in the halfway house for about six Yeah, but it, it was like a special – like now they have like these special programs because halfway house, your halfway house was probably when you had paroled. Now they have ones where you could do the rest of your time at a halfway house. Like I had 90 days left. So yeah, like, ours know. wasn't parole. It's called supervised release. So, yeah, okay, yeah. yeah. So yeah, we had action to do that now because the overcrowded thing, they're trying right. to you know get people they're, out of the prisons. Right. And so I was able, at the halfway house, I was able to go out because when you had, when you, um somebody went to look for a job or somebody went to school or whatever, they had to have a partner. So I was going out with everybody. Oh, gotcha. To, yeah, so yeah. that was pretty cool. I mean, I was catching a bus and stuff, but just still to be around out in the real world and, getting used to it. Like you said, it was weird. Yeah. I can't even imagine 10 years or eight years. Yeah. Uh, Cause I mean, it, it was, it was weird for just a year, just, just stepping back out. Uh, yeah. it, was, it was, it was surreal. At any point during that stretch, were you writing or were you were you journaling or were you thinking, I'm going to tell my story one day or was that not at all that part still, of your... That still wasn't in my head, but I was doing a lot of writing. I wrote a lot of letters to, I mean, just to keep it PG, I wrote a lot of letters to women. <laughs> I wrote a lot of letters. I mean, I actually got good telling stories about that because they were so vivid. And I didn't notice this until, <laughs> until they would tell me. They, I, like I talked to them, they was like, whoa. And I used to write, you know, family. And people that wrote me, I, I didn't mind writing a letter because it was like, once I start letting the pen bleed, it mm -hmm. just happens. Another thing was, it started off with uh, Benjamin Graham's The Intelligent Investor. I was in this stock market phase where I just wanted to know everything about the market. And what I did was kind of like summarize the entire book. And um, I sent it to Ryan and Keenan, and Ryan was like, you just summarized the entire <laughs> Intelligent Investor? I'm like, yeah, I'm bored. I ain't got shit else to do. But um, you sent it to them as as like a pitch, as like as nah, like just, just just this is what I'm doing. This is what this I'm, up what I'm to. doing right now. And once I'm invested, it's, it's like I'm there. But after that, I think Ryan starts sending me like ten books at a time. He'd be like, hey, I don't really got time to read these. Can you give me like a synopsis or whatever? And I'm like, hey, sure. I'll knock the book out in three four days. But but you were setting the foundation for like in your mind, you were gonna get out. No, this is not. I had no, no. clue. I had, nah, this was just me doing a favor for my partner. That was it. Like that was all, I didn't think nothing of it. I didn't think it was going to become anything. 
not knowing it was coverage. I didn't know it all, but I also was taking college courses in there as well, like business classes. But what really did it was I was at fire camp towards the tail end of my stint. I was there for like 18 months, really fought fires out there, almost died three, four times. But Ryan actually asked me, um, he was like, uh, hey, bro, you think you can write about your experience? And I was like, uh, I was like, nah, I really don't want to do that. Like, it just didn't interest me. I didn't want to think. The thing is. Ryan, well, Ryan asked you. Yeah, he asked me. The thing is, like, once you do a day, you're trying to get to the next day. I don't want to think about nothing that I went through at the time. But he actually was like, yeah, just write about your experience. And then at fire camp, you work for 24 hours and then you're down for 24 hours when you're on a fire campaign. On the 24 down, you're taking a shower, eating, getting rest and getting ready for your other 24 hours because you're going to spend the night on the mountain. My version of that was I, in West Virginia. Mm-hmm. And I was at level one federal. Yeah. So we had no wall. Yeah. It was yeah. like literally just a chicken wire fence surrounding the compound. But you're still on the compound. Yeah. You're locked up. You can't leave. Yeah. And I, my job that I got was working for the Camp Dawson, which was the National Guard base in West Virginia. And we yeah. would go over there and we would buff floors. We would clean the cottages. We would cook for the soldiers. This is right at the height of the, um, this is 90. So this is like the first Gulf War. Yeah. Okay. And it was a plum job because you got to leave the compound. You got yeah. to leave the prison and be out in the world. You get on the bus yeah. and drive. So your deal is kind of like that. Same thing. Um, the only thing is like when it's time to go fight a fire, we might be gone 20, 30 days. Right. Um, but just to go back when we were, we were doing our 24 hours down, I remember he, t- he asked me like two days prior and he was like, Hey, just write about your experience. And, um, I ended up just start going in. I wrote him a letter and I wrote it in a letter form. And then that way I just started just going specifically about, about working I'm on the fire about, line. No, no, no. Or just starting from the day I got arrested to all the way up until now. So thinking back, thinking back, was that your first time that you, uh, yeah. Had to reflect on Hell, your I mean, not your necessarily journey. reflect. That was the first time I recorded that reflection. I've You've thought in, about it. You had yeah, thought in, about in it. In prison, yeah. I didn't thought about my life a hundred times over. What I could have did, what I didn't do, what I should have done better, or like just how did I get here? Because, you know, it's just a combination of events and decisions that you made that get you in this space. So it's like, I thought about it, yeah. But to me, actually put the pen and paper, it was a different experience because I couldn't stop. Cause I start, it start clicking. Like when you thinking, thinking thought goes, thought goes, thought mm-hmm. goes. But when you writing, you're like, oh, I remember that. Oh, I remember mm-hmm. that. And it just started. My pen started bleeding. And I ended up with like 67 pages written <laughs> front and back. It was insane. You didn't write when you were incarcerated at all? I wrote to my family. I wrote to my friends. Thinking back then, I was a young kid. I was like just yeah. barely 21. Yeah, I sometimes kick myself. I'm like, man, I should have taken better notes, or I should have been <laughs> writing a script. Like, wow. Yeah. But I was, a, I was, I was a mess, and I, I just being down and having that experience wasn't enough for me. I actually had a worse time after I got out of prison. I mean, my drug use accelerated, and I, mean, I was on the verge of getting sent back for a, a much longer stretch because I was facing some serious time if I'd gotten, yeah. you know, arrested again. But, um. It wasn't until later, I, you know, at some point I decided, you know, I did want to make documentaries. And at a certain point after my thesis film in film school, which was about uh, a young boy who stutters and my wife stutters. Mm-hmm. And I met this kid at, you know, she used to go to conventions for, you know, people who stutter. And it's kind of, I felt my closeness to her and my need to try to understand her and her perspective and what it's like for her to live yeah. with something like this where you're made fun of and people finish your sentences and literally people laugh at you yeah. when you try to say your name and you hit a, a big block that I wanted to understand that. And the way I, for me, it was to make a movie. So That's I made crazy. this documentary. Yeah. The next movie after that was about myself and about, um, cause it, coming from a black family in Boston that was dealing with alcoholism, that was dealing with me being incarcerated, it wasn't something that the family ever talked about. And so I wanted, I felt that it had to be expressed. Yeah. But I knew even in making that documentary that I had more to say and talk about and that there was probably going to be something that maybe had to be rendered through fiction Yeah. because certain things are difficult in the nonfiction space. Not everybody yeah. wants to necessarily tell and engage that story. So that's when yeah. I began thinking about, and it began a process that continues today of me trying to 
somehow tell my story. Because unlike your thing, I'm blocked on some level. Everything that I've tried to write, I've tried to write, I've tried to fictionalize oh, okay. my experience into a character. And people who have read the script have felt a distance from the character. I haven't mm. felt like they understand the character in the world that I'm trying to express. Yeah. I feel like it's there when I'm in the process of writing, but I'm, I'm rendering it through a fictional character. So the process has been a lot different and I haven't shared it with hardly anybody. I'm very paranoid and afraid to share it. Yeah. I'm intrigued. Um, this is the first actually I've learned about this letter. Yeah. I think I've heard about it, but that you're thinking about maybe doing something, um, yeah. with it more. And I want to obviously talk to you more about it because I'm trying to kind of do yeah. a, a version of my story, which is not just my story, but it's the story of a black family in America, which, yeah. you know, I think our experience is a lot different than yours. Yeah. You mentioned experiences it's like where I want to say my creative becomes relevant because for a long time I struggle with like these writers that I'm coming across, these projects I'm doing, these people are freaking geniuses. You know what I'm saying? And I used to kind of doubt myself. And what I realized is like um, my experiences is where my power kind of lays. I've always been compelled to tell my story mm -hmm. um, because at times I lied, you know, when I, I don't know if I told you when I got out, you know, I, I was on supervised release for a minute and then um, I had been in college prior to being incarcerated, right? Yeah. All, all my friends were going to law school, medical yeah. school. And I went into a period where I was just like in denial that this even happened. Uh -huh. I applied for a job. I worked at this law firm in, in the mail room. I applied to the job. When I got to the application part where they ask you, have you been incarcerated? I checked, no. Oh. Okay. I was working that job, got out of there, and then worked at this elementary school, after school daycare program for the kids, you know, after yeah. school, a very well known private school in DC yeah. where president, you know, people, the important people yeah. send their kids, where I selected no uh, yeah. on that, that question that haunted me. And at a certain point, I decided I kind of got shooken up out of that and decided, you know, I'm just going to tell my story. I'm not going to make it a big deal. So when I applied to Cal for the film yeah. program, I didn't write about it in my essay in applying to the school, but I just noted it. And yeah. I just said, hey, I've been incarcerated. Just want to let you know, FYI. Yeah. And from that point forward, I'm convinced to this day that's why I got in because my GPA was horrific. <laughs> it, was, it was like 1.3 when I had to like, petition to get back into Howard because I was yeah. on academic probation just to finish Howard. Yeah. And then when I applied to Berkeley, I think it was with a 2.6 GPA, but I got in and, yeah. and I felt that there was something about the act of me acknowledging, you know, who I was and the fact that you could see F's, 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 D's, <laughs> C's. And then when I came back to Howard, it was like straight A's. Yeah. Just the art. Like, and the story. Yeah, and that, 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 that from that point forward, I felt compelled to be open about my story. And I felt compelled to want to understand my own story. And that storytelling yeah. could be a vehicle, some kind of therapy for me, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. But also that some of the movies that I felt moved me the most, that took me to an emotional place, were yeah. stories that felt authentic, that I could just sense that the writer or the director was coming from a, a place of personal experience. And that's just something that I felt I wanted to do. That's amazing. My, my, man, that's great. I don't know how to follow that up. <laughs> um, I mean, of course, when you're incarcerated, you read a ton of books and you read a ton of autobiographies. But at that time, I felt my story wasn't important. Like, I didn't think it was that unique or worth telling at the time, because, I mean, honestly, it's a thing that plays in your head that you became a statistic. And you like the rest of these cats in here or something like that. And and sometimes that's true and sometimes it's not. But then you got to think about if you don't have life, you still got a story to create. Mm -hmm. And as my life went on, like going through prison, getting out of prison, um, as of recently, I start 
doing like a lot of panels. Like I just talked to a, uh, some cats at a juvenile facility. Uh, this lady asked me to come talk to him and, you know, just explain to him about um what I do, where I work, what company I work for and what I do like on a day to day basis. And what I did was, and yes, these badass little kids, but I explained to him what I did and I didn't even do this on purpose, really. I got hot. I, got, I ran hot. So I took my jacket off and they saw my tattoos and they was like, oh, it was like, you blasted. They was like, where you get it from? I was like, oh, I got it when I was locked up. And so I kind of, that was kind of a segue into telling them like where I came mm-hmm. from instead of, it's not just this Hollywood thing you see. And as I was telling them about it, they ate it up. And then when it came for Q&A for the kids, I was bombarded. I'm talking about they was asking some great questions just about my past and how I feel now. And and then once I talked to a lot of the uh, directors of the program, they were like, it was kids that don't say a word that were super engaged. It was like, I don't know how you did it. And I wasn't even trying to be super relatable. I was just talking to them like, you know, we was outside kicking it or something, you know. I guarantee you one, if not more of those kids is going to take that and do something with it. Yeah, I, I hope I so. I guarantee you that. I hope so. It was one young cat. He he came with me. He was like, hey, man, I just got into uh, Pierce College. I'm trying to take this film class. It was crazy. He was like, it's crazy you came. We didn't know you was coming. And I just chopped it up with him. It was like, I can see the energy of what he wants to do is just where he's at now. And my best advice, I was like, one day at a time, bro. Like one day at a time, one assignment at a time, one lesson at a time. Don't overwhelm yourself with thinking you can take over the world or or make up what you've done in like a matter of a night. It's not going to happen. Just I just talk to keep that same energy, you know? Mm. It was dope, though. It was amazing. Well, it's funny because when I first heard about you, one of my first instincts was like, oh man, like, you know, I want to, I want to talk to D'Lo because there was a character in one of my earlier versions of the (laughs) script that was sort of like, like the more I got to know you, it felt coincidentally like that was who you were to a degree. And an earlier version of the script was about these two young black kids who are incarcerated, but from two different worlds. Yeah. One kid from more working class, kind of Richmond. You know, yeah. California and the other yeah. kid, suburban Boston, yeah. you know, upper middle class. And it was a story exploring their relationship. I still think that that story is going to be told one day, but the film has evolved into more of an idea of exploring a black family coming apart. Yeah. And, you know, at the center of that family being, you know, someone who is incarcerated and what that means and the ripple effect of that. And um, that's dope though, because it's like, I, I actually, start writing a short as well. But the thing is, it was just- I read a, it. Yeah, it was just an <laughs> idea of what I had in my head. And it's not, yes, it's a creative aspect to it, but it's also some of my experiences. I just had to get over the fact of not thinking I was creative enough to use my experiences to create a great story. Well, you have to get past that narrative of, yeah. it is the imposter syndrome, right? Yeah, yeah, like- You oh, have to yeah. push, you, have to, you yeah. have to push through that hard. I mean, but the reality is like, there are so many inspirations in close proximity to us every day like don't it's a pretty remarkable opportunity and when i read your script i you know it was inspiring to me exciting to me to see this example of this thing that you're trying to do yeah and i think it would be your first film if if, if you if you shoot this thing yeah so um that's exciting so what do you think do you think you're about to do this short film like do you feel like what kind of stories do you feel like you are going to be drawn to telling are you going to stay in the space of trying to reflect and tell some version of of your own story or do you feel the urge to sort of move beyond to move beyond that um i accepted the fact that i think i can be the best at telling what i know about so that's kind of like the lane i'm in right now and the thing is i start once i accepted that and start thinking about that and i start thinking about like um for instance, I had this idea. My favorite car is the S500 or S Class or whatever. And the reason being is when I was 14, no, 13, one of our friends, he was like 16 and he had got one. I mean, we know how he got it, but he picked us up and he just rode us around the neighborhood. And I'll never forget that. And the car has been my favorite entirely. And I was just like, maybe it's an idea there. And I, I'm like, okay, I have a million of these experiences. So I might as well use those to, you know, 
create the content that I want to create. And the thing is, it's like, you know, sometimes people work on projects they really don't want to work on. It's a check. But if you have the option to work on things that you love, that you're invested in, I think I should take advantage of that. I think anybody should. So, yes, I would, I'm would. i staying in this lane until, I mean, the opportunity arises to do something else. I mean, you never know because I'm in a space now where I don't feel any doors closed. So I might drift off into something else, you know? I think me and you, we might have to collaborate on this other idea. Because <laughs> I, I haven't seen this movie that I have in my mind. And I, yeah. I think I think my film has evolved into being more of a story of a black family. Yeah. But I, I'm seeing very clearly this movie of two young black kids, you know, coming yeah. of age, so to speak, in the system who come from two very different places. Yeah. So I've always been obsessed and interested in this idea of blackness and yeah. coming of age, identity. What does it mean to be black yeah. in this world that we live in? I think we're moving into the Prox Rex segment of our podcast. <laughs> um, um, you go first. We're, we're, we're now in our in the Prox Rex segment of our podcast. Yeah. Um, what inspires you right now, Dilo? I think inspiration comes from me being grateful right now and just realizing the opportunity that I have, and just realizing the position I'm in and not in survival mode, being like, okay, I'm living now, you know? And I'm, I'm, of course, I want to be way bigger than this and be a, more of an asset to this company, this great company that we're a part of, but um, just not being afraid or timid about, you know, uh, in a lack of a better word, just putting it all out there. I know I'm kind of late to the game. That's probably like maybe what has me questioning things like, oh, uh, I'm, in my thirties, uh, I should have been doing this. Um, I have to, you know, talk myself out of that. But, but thirties. I, uh, <laughs> I mean, Bro, I'm at where I'm at. <laughs> you have no idea how young you are. I, okay, now I, I do, I do. But no, nah, but that's it. Sometimes, um, that's that imposter syndrome. You know, just that voice in your head reminding you like all the bad shit. But then you got to kind of like buck up and be like, you know what? I'm in a good space. I'm breathing, <laughs> you know, it think, I mean, it sounds cliche, but things could be worse. You know, I've been, I've been there, done that. And it's like, I wake up every day with that attitude. Like sometimes it's just, um, I'm kind of programmed too. So like for anybody out there, I did a lot of time. So I can do the groundhog day type thing. Like I can wake up, work out, like I stick to a program and that helps because I don't have it's certain things. I don't have to think about that. I'm going to automatically do. So it's dope to be able to get up and have an idea and share with a bunch of intelligent people. And, they, and they're going to tell you the truth, if it's good or it's bad. And then if it's good, hey, we off to the races. Let's see what, what we can do, you know, to make this a reality. And that's kind of like what inspired me. Right on, right on. Man, my recommendations, there's a lot of movement from documentary to fiction. A lot of documentary filmmakers are moving into fiction. Yeah. And a lot of fiction filmmakers are moving in, into documentary. But there's a couple of um, sort of fiction filmmakers that I like to recommend just because they, I, I just love their, the messiness of their, <laughs> or the chaotic nature of their form, which to me equals authenticity. Yeah. So the Safdie brothers come to mind. Mm -hmm. You got to see Good Time. Okay. Uncut Gems. Of course. Is yeah. another one. Okay. And I'm, I'm also thinking about Sean Baker. Oh, okay. Who yeah. made this film called Tangerine, mm -hmm. which utilized actual people, not really actors, like sort of not non professional yeah. uh actors, so to speak. And that's something I'm very fascinated with is this idea of incorporating actual elements into potentially fiction movies. And I love directors who are have seem to have that skill. Uh Chloe yeah. Zhao kind of did it with Nomad Land. Yeah. In a really impactful way. So So I mean is it technically casting? They just get regular folks? Yeah. I mean, even in, even in nonfiction, you cast. I mean, yeah. you, you pick the people that, you know, you're going to interview or you pick the people that you're going to follow. You have to have an instinct that uh, they're going to take you somewhere Yeah, and that they're in a place where they're going to reveal. I always say with casting a documentary and some of my movies, people talk about that, like The Waiting Room is one, like, oh, it felt like fiction or or it felt like people didn't know you were there. How did you do that? Or how did you film in a way that they weren't aware? And I tell people, whenever you're, you step into someone's life and they're, they're in a crisis, 
that's the priority for them in that moment. They're dealing with the thing that's right in front of them. And so if they agree to be filmed and you're filming them, you, you quickly kind of fall back. Yeah, you and, let it happen. And what's unfolding in front of the camera is, is someone dealing with facing a, a crisis or a moral question. And, and through that, their character is revealed. And that is authenticity. And it's also what you try to write. If, if you're writing fiction, you want to write your characters into, into scenarios like that. And that's hard to do. Yeah. And I've been trying to do it like <laughs> writing fiction, write, writing dialogue, writing. It's hard. It, it's hard to get into a place where um, those characters really start speaking. That's why I'm looking forward to you bringing you into my, my world. We're going <laughs> to, we're going to get into each other. <laughs> we're going to support each other, D-Lo. Okay. A hundred percent. I read yeah. your script. We're going to talk more about it offline. I'm ready. But, uh, it, it's good, man. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. I appreciate it's got a lot. It, of, it's got a lot of promise, and I sensed your um, you trying to express something in yeah. there of, of you and and, yeah. a, and of your world um, and connect out yeah. to, to other people. And um, I think that you're going to be able to help me too. So I look oh, forward man, to that. I'm with it. I'm ready. You got me juiced. I'm ready to get cracking. All right, let's go <laughs> for real. In Proximity is a production of Proximity Media. If you like the show, be sure to follow, rate, and review it on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app, and tell your friends and loved ones to do the same. Seriously, you can do that right now. Send a link to someone who you think might really like this conversation. Learn more and read transcripts of this episode and others on proximitymedia.com. Don't forget to follow at Proximity Media on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. The show is produced by me, Paula Mardo. Executive producers are Ryan Kugler, Zinzi Kugler, Savo Hanian, and me. Our theme song and additional music is composed by Ludwig Gorenson. Ken Nana is our sound designer and mix engineer. Paulina Cherizova is our production assistant. Audio editing for this episode is by Cameron Kell. Special thanks to the whole Proximity Media team and to you for listening to In Proximity. Meet you back here next week. So when you wrote that out, mm -hmm. what was that like? Like, did you edit yourself? Was it stream of consciousness? Stream of consciousness. I just let it go. I didn't edit anything. It's funny because fast forward, Ryan got it. We didn't think nothing of it. We didn't talk about it at all. Um, I, we were on the set of Space Jam and I was working as an assistant um, and ta Coates actually visited the set. He was like, hey, bro. He was like, he was talking about fire camp. We was talking about, you know, my experience and all. He was like, I know you wrote about this. I said, no, I didn't. I blatantly lied. I was like, nah, I didn't write about this at all. He was like, bro, you can't tell me, Ryan, and have you write something. I'm like, man. I was like, yeah, I wrote a little something. But he was like, let me read it. And this is time to IT Coast. I'm like, hell no, you can't read nothing I write. Like, no. You arguably Why didn't you want him to read it? I mean, it's just like people showing Ryan their first movie or something like that.